Yeah, I was going on to add that um, <clears throat> of crucial importance to the BSA is that Professor Tripp chairs the Committee for British International Research Institutes, uh, better known by the not especially elegant acronym BIRI here at the British Academy. So to put it uh, inexcusably crudely, uh, he is the man with the money. <laughs> And the only person really who chairing his committee who has oversight of the seven uh, international British international research institutes that more seriously are, um, dare I say, the jewel in the crown of this institution, the British Academy. So that's quite enough from me, as I promised you. Uh, Charles Tripp, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much for your kind words. I wish I did have the money, but uh, I don't. It comes all from the central fount of our, uh, of our government. Um, and we help to pass it on and channel it to the Biri, which is one of the things that makes it worthwhile. So what I really wanted to give a warm welcome to everyone who's in the room, and this is the first time I've lectured in a room for two years, uh, but also, of course, to all the people online who I think can hear now, uh, who are tuning in. Uh, and to uh, welcome you all to what will be a fascinating evening of two lectures. Uh, the first by uh, John Bennett, Professor John Bennett, uh, and who's the director of the British School at Athens at the moment, and uh, Professor David R Rengro from uh, the Institute of Archaeology at UCL. And I also want to emphasize how pleased and honored I am to have been asked to introduce these speakers. Um, it gives me a chance to express my admiration for the British School in Athens, uh, for the leading role it's played among the other seven British International Research Institutes uh, linked to the British Academy. The depth and breadth of its research, uh, its encouragement of interdisciplinarity, its openness to new thinking, not only about antiquity, but about more recent histories of Greece and its environment. All of this speaks to the dynamic hub of research that is uh, the British School at Athens, learning from but also contributing to scientific and academic life in Greece and beyond. And in that sense, it's an exemplary British International Research Institute, fulfilling its mission so well and giving substance to the international research outreach that's so valued by the UK-based academic community and, of course, by ourselves at the British Academy. Um, and it's here, of course, that John Bennett has been a key figure. Uh, so it's fitting that I can use this occasion also to express my appreciation and thanks and that of the British Academy as a whole to John for his direction of the BSA during the past seven years and his role in making it what it is today and laying down the plans for what looks like exciting future developments in Kansas. Uh, and in doing so, uh, despite the energy and effort he's devoted to the BSA, He's managed to sustain his own impressive scholarly output, so really leading by example. So in his talk, as I understand it, John will be looking back at the past year, but also perhaps reflecting on his time at the BSA itself. So it is in some ways a bittersweet uh, occasion, as John will be stepping down as director later this year and returning to the University of Sheffield. Whatever battles he then has to face, and frankly, the words archaeology and University of Sheffield have been in the headlines in 2021 for all the wrong reasons, he can be confident in knowing that he leaves behind him a strengthened BSA and a legacy of scholarly achievement and academic hospitality that will continue to benefit all. So John, please, uh, I welcome you to the podium to talk about the work of the British School at Athens in 2021. Well, thanks very much, Charles. Now, can we just make sure that uh, um, I can be heard everywhere, including in this room? I know I can be heard in this room, but uh, we're seeing, not seeing anything on the screen. Oh, good, good. Okay. Basta. Enough. Um, last year, we uh, held this event over Zoom. Robin Osborne, our vice chair. Up the slide, there we go, there we go, good. Robin Osborne, our vice chair and I, spoke to an audience of almost 600 in Greece, in the UK and elsewhere. 
It's great to be back in person this evening in hybrid format so that many more can join us who cannot make it to London or understandably remain wary of in-person events while COVID-19 remains prevalent. British School at Athens has of course met, hosted many virtual events since April 2020 and this facility has enabled us to maintain regular contact with our many stakeholders worldwide as well as to draw in new interest, significantly augmenting our mailing list. Digital outreach has been complemented by further work to make our collections available over the internet to a worldwide audience. And this aspect of our activity points to one of the key words I like to use to describe the BSA, as I look back over the last six and a half years in post as director. And that word is innovation. Nor is it only a recent feature confined to our digital offerings. The Fitch Laboratory, for example, has pioneered innovation through science-based archaeology for almost 50 years now. The BSA, however, couples innovation with tradition. Our presence in Greece for 136 years now brings intangible benefits, authority, experience, contact, reputation, and tangible materials, particularly our 70,000 plus volume library, our rich archival collections, a focus of the digitization program, and legacy and reference material, especially at Knossos. Another strong element in that tradition is philanthropy. The BSA owes its foundation to a generous group of supporters who responded to appeal for funds in 1883 and raised 4,000 pounds, a sum that today seems entirely trivial, but sufficient then to build our first building and inaugurate the BSA. The first government grant came in 1895 but that tradition of philanthropy has continued and is becoming ever more important to sustain our overall level of activity and to enable us to realize specific significant goals like the Kansas 2025 project or our ambition to green our premises. And I'd like to add a third word to make a trio, partnership. Partnership with many individuals and organizations in Greece and with many UK higher education institutes and other organizations through which we conduct, facilitate and promote research in all areas of Hellenic studies across all arts, humanities and social science disciplines. We also partner with those many here in this room who choose to give us their generous support. All of these partnerships enrich what we do, indeed enable what we do. Partnership is a word you will hear throughout this talk. We endeavoured to capture the essence of the BSA in a vivid and upbeat manner in five five-minute videos launched last November. If you haven't watched them yet, I'd encourage you to do so and to share them with people less familiar with us. You can find them all on the About Us page of our website. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Not the first time you've seen this. Despite continuing uncertainty, we ran a full program in 2021 as this infographic compiled by our London Development and Administrative Officer, Kate Smith, vividly demonstrates. Almost all our lectures, seminars, workshops, panels, and other events were held virtually, but our facilities in Athens and Knossos were more extensively used than in 2020, the library remaining open from June onwards. We supported four fieldwork projects, and towards the end of the summer, ran our undergraduate course on the archaeology and topography of Greece in person, if not quite as usual. I present a summary of these activities here with a mixture of pleasure and relief that we were able to achieve so much. You can find out more in our June and December newsletters downloadable from our website. George Finley is a name that resonates with those who know the BSA the Athens common room, if nothing else. In 1899, his papers, books, and antiquities collection came to the BSA forming our Finlay collection. And it's a great pleasure therefore, before the 2021 bicentenary, bicentenary resides into memory, recedes into memory, to highlight the BSA's legacy contribution to that bicentenary in the form of a three-year research project supported by generous funding from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation unpublished archives of British Philhellenism during the Greek Revolution of 1821 that will deliver a digital resource and a published international conference on Philhellenism. The BSS first 1821 fellow, Dr. Michalis Sotiropoulos, 
began selecting for digitization and transcription a significant body of papers from the BSA's Findlay collection. He is also studying papers of the London Greek Committee founded in 1823 that are held in the National Library of Greece. Felicity Crow, Felicity Crow, archive project assistant, has set up the digital catalog and the first major batch of items has already gone for scanning. In addition to preparing the digital output that will be available through the BSA's digital collections portal, portal Michalis will also organize an international conference to mark the bicentenary of the London Greek Committee's establishment. A collective volume based on those papers will appear in our series Studies in Modern Greek and Byzantine Studies under Michalis's editorship. In November, we offered a behind the scenes view of that project, Finlay in Focus, including video interviews with Roderick Beaton, whom you just met, and Michalis Sotiropoulos, as well as a taster view of a small exhibition entitled Bones, Stones and Prehistory, curated by Michael Loy and Deborah Harlan, comprising 21 objects from the museum, combined with material in the archive and library, reflecting Finlay's broader interests in prehistory and paleontology. We plan to make these videos more widely available soon in our video archive. Finlay in Focus was just one of many events delivered virtually in 2021 that received over 7,000 live views from around the world while video recordings of them on our YouTube channel had received over 7,000 views as of last week. I hope you'll agree that the range of coverage is impressively broad. Upper House seminars included Yanis, Yanis Hamilakis and Rafi Greenberg comparing colonialism, archeology span and the national imagination in Greece and Israel. John Bentliff and Anthony Snodgrass summing up the important work of the long running Boeotia survey project. As COP26 started in Glasgow, Amy Bogard gave a series seminar on lessons from the past about sustainability, and Juan de Lara shone new light on lighting effects in Greek temples, particularly the Parthenon. Public lectures ranged from a well-attended presentation, a well-attended presentation on the life and work of John Craxton by his biographer, Ian Collins, the annual Bader Archive Lecture on George Finlay and Scottish Philhellenism by Alistair Grant, another very well attended Friends co uh, Committee talk by Judith Heron on Ravenna, a keynote by Alexia Petzalis Diomedes on the life of the Levant Company merchant Thomas Bergen, and the annual BSA Institute of Classical Studies Lecture on striking recent finds from the ancient city of Eliki by two important uh, experienced archaeologists from the Ministry of Culture and Sport, Anastasia Gadolu and Erofili Kolia. Conducting live discussions in virtual format is difficult, but can enable panelists to join across continents. We're learning how to do this through a series of panels spanning revolutionary ideas around 1821, discussions of recent books by Michael Dwellin Smith on Venizelos and Mark Mazauer on 1821 and the making of modern Europe, a lively conversation with broadcaster, author and stand-up Natalie Haynes, and recently a genre spanning pair of panels on inclusion versus inclusion in translation. Ah. Conference and workshops are perhaps the most difficult to manage virtually. We hosted Travel and Archaeology in Ottoman Greece at the Age of Revolution, convened by Alexia Petzalis Diomedes in September. We did, that was virtual. And our first hybrid event, a workshop on the Greek language after antiquity, uh, convened by Professor David Holton, took place in Athens in November. Not everything was virtual, however. Former development officer Nicholas Salmon and our London Development and Administrative Officer Kate Smith curated a beautiful exhibition at the 12 Star Gallery on the 20, uh, reflecting 20 years of BSA arts bursary holders. Uh, the well-attended private view on the 21st of July included several of the artists and the exhibition ended in September, but was followed in October by a panel discussion among three former bursary holders, Vanessa Gardner, Eleanor Wright and Annabel Dover, chained, chaired by Malcolm Quinn of the University of the Arts of London. Slightly ironically, the physical exhibition will soon become permanent in digital form on our website. We continue to make publicly available more of the rich collections in Athens in this way. For example, over 7,000 images in the Society for the Pro Promotion of Hellenic Studies BSA image collection should see the last substantial batch of images, including those from Sparta and Perhora, go live in the next couple of months, accompanied as usual by related blog posts. 
This is not merely a virtual picture book. And embarrassingly, page five is missing. <laughs> oh, no, here it is. God, everything's going wrong today. This is not merely a virtual picture book, however. Among other data, each fully searchable record contains information about the physical object, the photographer, when known, and the location depicted linked to a map interface. The collection is relevant, therefore, to, to the study of disciplinary history, late 19th century academic networks, the history of pedagogy, and the early development of mass tourism. Conventional publication continued, of course, with our print journals, volumes 116 of the annual and 67 of archaeological reports, the latter in partnership with the Hellenic Society. Archaeology in Greece online continued too in collaboration with the uh, French School in Athens, and the database has now reached over 15,000 publicly available entries. 2022, we'll see another volume in our in-house supplementary series, uh, Knossos, House of the Frescoes by Emilia Oddo and Vaso Fotu, and more legacy material published to modern standards. Two new volumes, the ninth and 10th, in our Modern Greek and Byzantine Studies series, published by Routledge, will appear in April and later this year. Dr. Bella Dimova came to the end of her A.G. Levendis Fellowship, working on the textile economy of Greece and the Southern Balkans in the classical to Hellenistic periods, with great success despite the widespread challenges. We wish her well and welcome her successor, Dr. Tulsi Parik from Cambridge, who is researching mobilizing Greek religion, the dynamics of sacred space in ancient Greece from the archaic to the Hellenistic period. She will look at interactions between worshippers and their environment, including the built sanctuary and wider religious landscape, uniting different methodological approaches to achieve a more materially aware approach to the study of Greek religion. There'll be more to report on Tulsi's research next year. Dr. Anna Judson started a two-year Marisz Klodowska Curie Fellowship in October 2020, funded under the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. Her project, Writing at Pylos, Paleography, Tablet Production, and the Work of the Mycenaean Scribes, RAP for short, focuses on the practices involved in creating the Linear B documents from the late Bronze Age Palace of Pylos. There are two main elements. First, examining the first stage of producing the Linear B texts, namely making the clay tablets, and second, analyzing in detail the handwriting and how the forms of written signs can vary. The first research strand has taken her into the Fitch laboratory to learn about clay as a material and to carry out experimental tablet manufacture. The second has required long hours examining the originals in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. Professor Maria Pretzler, BSA visiting fellow for 2020-21, could only arrive late in the academic year but made the most of access to the library for her monograph, The Peloponnesians and Their Allies, a study of the Peloponnesian League, widely conceived, but with a particular focus on the Allies. Our 2021-22 Early Career Fellow, Dr. Matthew Walker, arrived early, spending autumn rather than spring in Athens, exploring how knowledge of Greek architecture was acquired in the field and transmitted back to Britain in the period before systematic study in situ began in the later 18th century. An important figure here was Thomas Vernon, who reached Athens in 1675 and sadly was murdered in Iran, or Persia as it was, in 1677. His journal survives, fortunately, in the Library of the Royal Society. The BSA's 2021-2021 arts bursary holder, Aileen Carlson, finally made it to Athens in October for shorter and anticipated. She concentrated on extending the fictional part of her practice-based doctoral thesis, using historical women whose lives she blends with her own memories. She focused on Emily Penrose, daughter of the first BSA director, and her 1887 diary kept in our archive. Emily was Elin's guide to the city through her entries about spending time sketching at the Acropolis or visiting the Temple of Olympian Zeus. Our 2020-21 research fellows, or students as we quaintly call them, Dr. Rosanna Valenti and Matteo Randazzo, managed the challenges dealt them well, uh, adapting their research plans to COVID-19 restrictions. 
Both were researching a similar time period, Matteo, the archaeology of the Emirate of Crete, and Rosanna, the development of post-antique settlement in the areas of Sparta's Roman theatre, with an emphasis on ceramic evidence. This year's uh, Bradford MacDonald Award is shared between Drs. Donald Crystal from Cardiff, who is investigating the relationship between local populations and Greek-speaking settlements in the North Aegean in the 8th to 4th centuries BC, using settlement, funerary, and epigraphic evidence, and Rosanna Valenti again, who continues her research on ceramics from post-antique Sparta. They are joined by Macmillan Rodewald student, Marcella Jobbe from Oxford, who's based in the Fitz Laboratory and is exploring Greek colonization through the study of ceramic production and technology, as well as the changing patterns of pottery consumption in Campania during the eighth to seventh centuries BC, work that she had commenced earlier in 2021 as a Fitz Laboratory bursary holder. There'll be more information about Marcella's, Rosanna's and Donald's research in our June 2022 newsletter. Two more doctoral students held Fitch bursaries in 2021. Alice Clinge from Cornell researches the use of pigments in domestic contexts in Greece from the classical to Roman periods, both in raw form and as applied to wall plaster, ceramics and other media, building on master's research at Warwick. Using a historical pigment supplier, she produced a collection of slides for microscopic analysis as well as taking portable XRF readings for elemental analysis. The data collected will act as standards for microscopic and elemental analysis of ancient pigments. Anna Carligiotti from the Cyprus Institute is working with former BSA student Effie Nikita on biocultural transformations in central mainland Greece from the classical to the Roman era. era. At the Fitch, uh, Anna is conducting macroscopic analysis of human skeleton remains of primary and secondary inhumations and cremations from cemeteries in various, of various types, spanning the classical to Roman period, excavated by the effort of Eastern Attica. Using rich osteoarchaeological evidence in combination with mortuary data and historical information, Anna aims to develop the study of biocultural determinants of identity, as reflected in health inequalities, differential access to food, etc. Which brings me conveniently to the Fitch Laboratory, now only two years shy of its 50th birthday and led by its director, Evangelia Kiriadzi. The lab adapted its work rhythms to shifting restrictions and produced a larger than usual number of analyses while also maintaining considerable research momentum. Fitch staff, associate researchers and partners in a number of institutions across Europe and North America worked on more than 30 projects in the past year. Through the Fitch, the BSA is now a partner in two training and research networks. The first network, PLACE, announced last year is a high profile partnership to train early stage researchers in the interdisciplinary study of pre-modern plasters and ceramics, hence PLACE, the most abundant materials in archeological science. Coordinated by the Cyprus Institute with eight partners, including UCL and Cambridge, the network has almost 4 million in funding from the EU's Horizon 2020 framework and runs until 2025. The project has a website where, among other things, you can watch the formal startup event held virtually last March. In addition to hosting several training and outreach events over the next three years, the Fitch is also holding one of PLACE's 14 early stage researchers, Timote Ogawa. His doctoral research concerns the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age transition in the Northern Aegean through the study of cooking pots and cooking installations at the site of Tumba Thessalonikis, combining detailed macroscopic study with scientific techniques to reconstruct their manufacturing technology, provenance and use. He will also enjoy a secondment uh, in Cambridge to acquire familiarity with organic residue analysis, especially protein analysis. The second project is an international. The second project is an international research network called PXRF CUN, funded by the CNRS in France, that brings together 10 institutions from Mediterranean countries with long traditions in ceramic studies, coordinated by the Centre d'études Alexandrine. The aim is to review current practices across different laboratories and agree a common protocol for the calibration and use of portable XRF devices that have recently become popular for chemical elemental analysis of ceramic materials 
and how their data should be treated to ensure quality and comparability. The question of mobility has been central to Fitch research, mobility of goods and study of trade, and more recently, mobility of craftspeople and technology transfer. Two recently launched projects focusing on two emblematic Greek pilgrimage sites, Delos and the sanctuary of Zeus on Mount Lycaon, will shed light on human mobility and their networks of economic and political transactions. On Mount Lycaon, uh, samples have been selected to identify the origin of both the ceramic vessels and the animal bones deposited on the altar over almost a millennium. Pottery sampling from around the Peloponnese is underway and comparative analysis will provide valuable reference evidence for tracing sources. On Delos, by contrast, the starting point is the question of local ceramic production. A large number of samples have already been selected and their analysis will be combined with prospection of potential raw materials on Delos and neighboring islands. Understanding ceramic te technology depends crucially on knowing how to identify key steps in ceramic vessel production, including how potters adapted their raw materials. The global ethnographic literature documents the use of wood ash, often the waste product from previous firings, as temper to uh, improve the workability, workability of raw clay. Archaeologically, however, only rare cases have been found, and there's no definitive way of identifying this material as temper. The Fitch developed and ran a successful cross-disciplinary experimental program in partnership with Professor Ian Freestone of UCL and Dr. Panayotis Karkanas, the director of the American School's Wiener Laboratory, to identify wood ash temper and ceramics, as well as to understand the motives behind its addition. Moreover, wood ash temper has now been identified within the Fitch's extensive reference collection from Greece and beyond. A set of jumbled pages, sorry. In 2021, our Knossos Research Centre once again saw fewer of the public facing events that have enriched its activities in recent years, but two museum educational programmes were successfully put in place for 43, 43 school children from sherds to pots and cooking and eating in Menno and Crete. The BSA also participated in the launch of an exhibition at the Heraklion Museum, Philoxeni Archaeologia, with a presentation on the BSA's work in Crete from 1893 to World War I. Research continued in the Knossos Stratigraphical Museum on material held there and on the INSTAT-funded curation project that is systematically digitizing the Knossos Stratigraphical Museum's collections. The Knossos 2025 project continues with relatively low visibility as we focus on identifying major funding, although a number of significant but modest donations continue to come in. There is a new focus on the project, thanks to the addition to our team of our new development executive, Miles Stevenson. And the project has its own video featuring patron Victoria Hislop, who's here this evening, uh, on the dedicated Knossos 2025 page in the Join Us section uh, of the website. Remaining on Crete, July 2021 saw the beginning of a new three-year collaboration between the effort of Antiquities of Lasithi, led by Christos Sofianou, the effort of Underwater Ant Antiquities, and the BSA, directed by Theotokis Theodoulou from the Underwater Antiquities, Andrew Chaplin from Oxford, and Carl Nappett from Toronto. Underwater survey was conducted around Palekestro, where sporadic underwater finds have suggested sea level change, and an ancient shoreline in both Hyona and Kuremenos bays considerably further out than at present. The project promises significantly to broaden our understanding of this key site, where the BSA has worked since 1902. Work began in the shallow waters along the coastlines of Kuremenos and Hyona Bays, using drone and underwater photography for, for photogrammetry and scuba diving. Bronze Age Minoan structures were mapped in Kuremenos Bay. South of the modern harbour, there's a rectangular structure at about two metres depth, together with other nearby walls of probable Minoan date. At least two rooms were discernible and possible stone floor. To the south, remains of a circular structure were identified also at the same depth with associated pottery of potentially third millennium date, recalling similar Tholos structures of that period elsewhere in East Crete. Immediately to the north, Pythos fragments were located, one example with rope decoration, probably dating to the late known one period.
structures of the Roman period were found in both Kuremenos and Chiona Bays, a Roman mole at depth of about 1.4 meters was relocated and, re and photographed and similar submerged buildings in the north end of Chiona Bay were re-photographed and studied. Exploration further out and at greater depths revealed a Roman wreck dating to the second century AD northwest of Cape Placa, loaded principally with two, about 240 Beltran 2B amphorae uh, in its surface layer. It's about 13 meters long by eight meters wide and lies at a depth of between 19 and a half and 23 and a half meters. It's possible that some of the wooden hull may be preserved given its location. Underwater reconnaissance will continue in 2022 alongside a targeted excavation of structures on the current shoreline. Two new projects promise to shed important light on the insular Eastern Aegean, an interaction with what is now the Turkish mainland. A further season of intensive, a first season of intensive survey on the island of Samos was co-directed by Anastasia Christofilopoulou from the Fitzwilliam Museum, Michael Loy, the BSA's assistant director, Nisha McSweeney from Vienna, and Yana Mokrysheva from Cambridge. Samos, an important, a powerful player in maritime trade and a place of pilgrimage because of the much, much frequented sanctuary of Hera, was exceptional in having a single city-state in the east, while some of its richest economic resources lay in the west. This configuration contrasts with other large Aegean islands such as Rhodes, Chios and Lesbos, home to multiple city-states. Western Samos has not yet been the sub subject of systematic archaeological survey, so WASAP, as the project is called, aims to analyze how the rural landscape in the West developed and to assess whether the Western part of Samos was more like an island within an island, while also articulating Samos with a wider Anatolian Aegean seascape. Previous knowledge from liter literature research entered into a points of interest, a POI database, um, allowed uh, targeting of different areas for research. Intensive survey was restricted to an area north of Cambos Marathok Kambu, centered on Ayushkiani's church. Field walkers spaced at 10 meter intervals, covered just under 10 hectares, counting visible surface sherds and tile, and collecting diagnostic sherds and a representative range of wares. Preliminary analysis shows the highest density of material in the area of Ayushkiani's church and terraces to the east and north. The majority of finds collected were medium or courseware ceramics or tile, most collected ceramics are Byzantine in date, while a small but significant number of diagnostic sherds in the immediate vicinity of a church can be dated to the first millennium BC. The 2022 season will be longer, with a larger team, including separate data and field laboratory teams. The BSA returned to Chios for a new collaboration with the effort of Antiquities of Chios, led by Olga Vasi and Andrew Bevan of UCL. Like Samos, Chios's position at the interface between the Eastern Aegean and Western Anatolia means it played an important role in major patterns of cultural, demographic, and political flux. The site of Emborio provides fine detailed single location data on long-term patterns from deeper prehistory to the present, but presents challenges that include the lack of a wider landscape contextualization. The Emborio Hinterland Project, EHP, seeks to address this with a survey of a 10 kilometer square area around the site the size deliberately chosen with a view to efficient, successful publication. Excavation and informal survey by the BSA from 1953 to 1955 at Emborio and later Catofana to the West, plus more recent rescue work in the vicinity by the Greek Archaeological Service, offer a good context for the survey. Furthermore, researchers uh, recently identified across the strait in Cheshme Izmir area, in, sorry, I beg your pardon, Furthermore, research has recently intensified across the strait in the Chesme Izmir area, addressing specifically the Neolithic and Bronze Age, offering opportunities for comparison between material culture sequences. A two week program of intensive field walking was conducted in July and early August, uh, covering about one square kilometer, focusing on the immediate headland of a prehistoric Emborio. Uh, and a block slightly further south in the Dottia Foki valleys. Individual surveys, sailors walked in teams of four to five at 10 meters spacing, each navigating with a handheld GPS and recording counts of finds observed, as well as collecting diagnostics. Prehistoric material, both Neolithic and Bronze Age, concentrated around the Emborio headland. A further cluster of prehistoric material was found around the known early Bronze One site of Foki and around another hilltop immediately to its southwest. 
In the Doccia Valley, a striking mix of discrete archaic classical Hellenistic Roman, late Roman and medieval scatters seem to indicate farms or small estates, although there's some evidence for a possible archaic cult site. Next year will be spent on study of material with a view to further field walking and remote sensing uh, in 2023. The BSA's tradition of research in the earlier prehistory of Thessaly and Macedonia, reaching back to the days of Wace and Thompson and the First World War, continues with the first season of a five-year collaborative research program between the effort of antiquities of Ceres and the BSA, focusing on the Neolithic site of Tumba Seron uh, and the nearby Strimon Valley. The project is led by, led by Dimitra Malamidou from the Efferet uh, and Nicholas Sorzin from the National Cheng Kung University of Taiwan and James Taylor at York, who unfortunately could not participate in person due to institutional travel restrictions. Work accomplished in this first season involved magnetometer, drone and pedestrian survey, as well as first steps in the project's archaeological ethnography program. Geophysical survey recorded magnetic anomalies, many correlating with similar measurements in the region, including those verified by excavation. These were characteristic of burnt buildings, ovens and hearths on the hilltop, as well as on the adjacent slopes. Some buildings seem to be arranged radially, while others are arranged along parallel rows, suggesting a possible chronological difference, as well as possible horizontal dislocation over time. Using the same grid uh, as the magnetometry survey, but extending it north and west, Zorzin conducted pedestrian survey covering the northern, western, and southern sides of the, sides of the tumba. Concentrations of pottery were particularly high on the top, remained high on the south slope, but were much less dense on the western and northern slopes. All diagnostic material so far suggests a late Neolithic date between 5,300 and 4,300 BC. Survey on the tumba itself was complemented by a general reconnaissance of the regional landscape identifying known local Neolithic sites, while and Iona Andoniadu initiated an archaeological ethnography of the surrounding area, focusing on the continuities and disconnections between present and past. A full season combining excavation and survey is planned for 2022. Archaeological research always forms a significant part of our portfolio because of our legal role in obtaining fieldwork and study permits for UK-based projects and researchers. Without the BSA, UK-led fieldwork could not take place, nor would the almost 200,000 of research funding not income to the BSA, won by projects in 2021, be spent. Our work would not be possible without the cooperation and assistance of numerous colleagues in the Ministry of Culture and Sport. In particular, I express the BSA's gratitude to Mr. Yorgos Didaskalu, Secretary General of the Ministry, Dr. Polixeni Adam Veleni, Director General of Antiquities, and Dr. Elena Kunduri, Director of Prehistoric and Classical Antiquities, as well as the numerous others in the ministry and those in charge of the relevant efforts of antiquities. I also recognize the general's financial support from a wide range of bodies and individuals that sustains our projects in the field. Further details of these projects appear in our December 21 newsletter and on Archaeology in Greece online, and you see the entries for AG online uh, for 2021 for all four projects here. As Carol referred to earlier, in June 2021, Dr. Elizabeth, or Lisa French, as she was known to us, the BSA's first female director, passed on, aged 90, active until the end, over a long career in the field. The Times, Telegraph and Guardian carried obituaries, and Lisa was also featured in BBC, 4's, BBC Radio 4's Last Word. Next year's annual will carry a full account of her life by Sue Sherrod. An event scheduled for April 2020 to mark the inception of Alan Wace, her, Lisa's father, Mycenae excavations, was postponed until September 21. Unfortunately, it thereby became a memorial to Lisa too. She will be sorely missed by a large international community of scholars and friends, and our sincere condolences go to her family, friends and colleagues. This is a period of change. Dr. Carol Bell, as we heard earlier, indeed has stepped down as chair of council after five years in that role and an even longer stint before that as honorary treasurer. We thank her most warmly for her service to the BSA and look forward to her continuing input on our investment committee and no doubt in other parts of the BSA. She's succeeded by Professor Roderick Beaton, a distinguished Hellenist and long-term associate of the BSA, and Professor Robin Osborne continues as vice chair of council. 
Later in the year, I myself will hand over the reins in Athens to the next director, Professor Rebecca Sweetman from St Andrews, whose experience in her home institution of St Andrews and as a former BSA assistant director will ensure her success. I offer her my warm wishes for her tenure of this enormously rewarding and exciting yet demanding post. Our development officer, Dr. Nicholas Salmon, took up a new opportunity at the Badisches Landesmuseum in Karlsruhe in October after devoting enormous energy over four years to building the BSA's development function. Part of Nick's role has been assumed by Kate Smith, who is now full time with the new title of London Development Administrative Officer. And we have also engaged as a consultant, a fundraising professional with almost 30 years of experience, Miles Stevenson, who will focus on higher level fundraising as our development executive. In Athens, Dr. Halvard Inyed left his post as IT officer to pursue full-time research. He was replaced by Nathan Meyer, who like everyone else in the BSA, it seems, also brings 30 years of experience as an IT professional in this case. Assistant librarian Sandra Pepelassis followed librarian Penny Wilson Zarganis into retirement after a mere 28 years in the role. Sandra's post was filled by Evgenia Vigliotti, who has worked both with our neighbors across the garden in the American school and in the National Library of Greece. An innovation this year is a full-time paid internship divided between the library and archive, replacing what was very unkindly referred to as the old library slave. And Tom Pull, Tom Bull is the first holder of that post. The uncertainties that remained in 2021 led us once again to postpone all but one of our courses. We offered two four session virtual courses, a short course for teachers organized around the Homeric world, a core component of the classical civilization syllabus, and a new offering, a short course in Byzantine archaeology, art and archaeology, combining seminar presentations with multimedia elements, which had 80 participants. We did run the undergraduate summer course in archaeology and topography of Greece over two 10 day sessions in August and September with participants in a bubble based at the BSA and centered, uh, catered on site. Museums and sites in Athens were the focus with day trips to sites, including Marathon, Mycenae and Delphi. And we hope to be able to run all our courses in 2022, but please keep an eye on our website for updates. The undergraduate course turns 50 this year and has welcomed almost 1400 students taught by 97 tutors and led by 12 assistant directors. And we are thrilled to be marking the anniversary this Friday with a celebration at Senate House and the launch of this wonderful book of reminiscences, reminiscences by students, tutors and assistant directors produced by Michael Loy and Kate Smith. Copies are available this evening as a kind of soft launch. Mention of an undergraduate course may seem out of place in the context of a research focused presentation, but it is fully consistent with our aim to develop careers to build the next generation of researchers, as Carol said earlier. A number of participants started their academic careers on this course, while the majority do not follow an academic career, yet retain an affection for the BSA and an interest in our work, becoming supporters or donors. Which brings me back to philanthropy. This detail from our 1886 report shows BSO donations. We notice a few names, Gladstone, Jane Harrison, and Richard Jebb, for example. This graph from the present demonstrates just how important such sources of income beyond our annual grant from the British Academy, for which we are most grateful, uh, are to sustain our high level of activity. It would be nice to increase the distance between the two lines. I hasten to add by raising the top line and also to smooth the upper line whose spikes reflect sporadic large donations. All donations make a difference and they're as important now as they were when the BSA was first mooted in 1883. This is the last time I'll stand here as director. So in closing, I take this opportunity to thank all BSA staff, present and past, in Athens, Knossos and London, for all they have done for the BSA over the period of my directorship. It's an absolute given that without them, the programs I've summarized here now for seven times would simply not have been possible. It would be remiss of me here in Carlton House Terrace not also to thank again, sincerely the British Academy for its support and also my BIRI colleagues, my British International Research Institute colleagues from Rome to Nairobi 
for their collegiality as we seek closer partnerships, further strengthening the, cap the capability to enhance the UK's research's international dimension. I also take this opportunity to thank all of you who have supported us financially through regular or one-off donations, large or small, over the years, and particularly the past two that have presented us all with so many challenges. Your generosity has sustained our key activities throughout, and we're most grateful to all of you. And on that note, I end my report on the work of the BSA in 2021 with a still from our video on Knossos, in the hope that next year's work of the BSA will bring good news on our important project there. Many thanks for your attention.